Thanks for joining us today to talk about growing your business with agritourism and the land use and policy considerations you'll need to take into account. Agritourism comes in many shapes and sizes, and growing your business to include these activities means you not only have to consider how they impact your business, but how your new activities impact your community and what permits or licenses you need to operate them. Whether you're thinking of adding farm dinners, a berry festival, a pumpkin patch, guest accommodations, or a you pick, you'll need to seek approval from local regulatory agencies, which can be an intimidating process. Our goal today is to remove the fear factor and provide you with a good idea of what permits and policies you'll want to take into consideration when you're starting your agritourism business. My name is Erica Palmer, and I'm the founder of Clayton Pitchfork. I've been working in agritourism for more than 14 years, and when I started having dinners on farms, I read all the regulations I could find. I applied for liquor permits and temporary restaurant permits, and I thought I'd done everything right. But just days before I was expecting more than 100 people to come to dinner, I received notice that I was in violation of local ordinance, and if I had the dinner, I could be subject to hefty fines or even jail time. That experience has made me sort of untraditionally qualified to talk about land use policy. And more so, I'm fully committed to making sure that you don't have a similar experience. I've spent the better part of the last three years learning the details of policies that impact agritourism in all 36 counties in Oregon. I want to be very clear, I'm not a land use planner, nor am I a lawyer. Some policies change constantly. So although we're gonna talk in great detail about these issues, please do use the links that we provided to find experts and the most current information. Because land use policy is both the most complicated piece of the permit puzzle and the key to what opportunities you can pursue, let's start there. In 1973, the Legislative Assembly passed the Oregon Land Use Act. This act required that all Oregon cities and counties adopt a comprehensive plan that met mandatory standards. They were designated to cultivate Oregon's economy while conserving our farmland and natural resources. Without this plan, we wouldn't have the beautiful green spaces that we all enjoy playing in or farming in in such close proximity to urban areas. As much as the goal set, in the 70s were established on a statewide basis, the implementation is largely crafted by local jurisdictions. In other words, each county and city has the opportunity to craft a policy that reflects the needs of their area, as long as it stays within the confines of state policy. In addition to the state legislative assembly and our regional governments, we have the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development who are also involved with planning. They're committed to conserving coastal, farm, forest, and other resource lands and guiding development to less sensitive areas. While at the same time, they're helping support the creation of economically vibrant communities. Their regional solution centers are staffed with people that are incredibly knowledgeable about planning and can offer tremendous insight, especially of a historical nature. Although our planning process might seem overly complex, it is truly what makes Oregon such a diverse and beautiful state. In 2011, the Oregon legislature passed Senate Bill 960. It created a process by which a county may conditionally approve agritourism and other commercial events or activities that are related to and supportive of agriculture in an area zoned for exclusive farm use. That's a lot to digest. Let's break it down a little bit. This bill means that if you currently have a working farm, you may have the opportunity to invite the public to enjoy your farm and charge a fee for the additional service, event, or activity that you're offering. These activities must somehow relate to your primary business. In other words, if you buy a piece of land with the dream of having decadent farm dinners and overnight guest accommodations, you must first plan to make a farm operation on your land. 
I like to think about agritourism as a spectrum. At one end, we find activities that are really closely tied to the primary farming activity. For instance, if you're a berry farmer and you're offering you pick strawberries, the correlation to the crop you're selling is very clear. Similarly, if you're growing Christmas trees or dahlias and you're offering you cut, we can clearly see how having more guests to your farm is increasing the sales of your crop. When we move to the middle of the spectrum, we find farm stands. Although you might be thinking, well, that's just one step beyond you pick. A farm stand permit also allows farms to sell products they don't grow and to have some promotional activities. So let's say you are a berry farm and your farm stand might want to offer supplies that you need to turn those berries into jam and can them and lemonade to quench your thirst after a sunny day of picking. You would need a farm stand permit. Additionally, you might want to have a berry festival during the peak of your season and offer your guests some additional food items, educational opportunities, or entertainment. Or perhaps you want to encourage school groups to come tour the fields and picnic on your lawn. All of those things would happen in the middle of the spectrum. And at the far end, we have activities that might be permissible with an agritourism permit or a mass gathering permit. Those things would include a concert, some of the events that we're seeing pop up on farmland for the solar eclipse, or a carnival. Agritourism permits are also issued for things like cooking classes using farm products, farm stays, and farm to table events. Where permits are available, they impose conditions on things like noise, parking, and sanitation. And there's a limit to how many events you may have each year. The maximum in a calendar year is 18. Additionally, agritourism events are intended to be held outside without the construction of permanent or temporary structures. And lastly, but not least, the revenue from agritourism activity must be incidental and subordinate to the primary farming activity for which you are zoned. It's very important to note that abiding by land use policy is the foundation of your permitting process, but it is not the only permit you'll require. For instance, if you're going to have a dinner on a farm, you'll also need to obtain the appropriate food service permit. And if your dinner includes alcohol, you'll need a permit from the OLCC as well. If you're planning to add food service or a mobile cart to your business, you'll need to talk to your local health department, and depending on your products and service level, you might need to talk to the ODA. We'll discuss both of these in more detail in a little bit, but do keep in mind that land use is step one, and your planner may very well be able to direct you to the additional resources you'll need to implement your new business activity. Wineries operate under a slightly different set of statutes when it comes to tourism opportunities, even though they're also operating in exclusive farm use land. Wineries may offer activities ranging from tastings and tours to outdoor concerts, celebratory gatherings, facility rentals, and limited service restaurants. Wineries may also offer bed and breakfast accommodations. The specifics of what they may offer is determined by the size of the winery, and size is defined by both the amount of wine they produce and the amount of land they own. If a farm that is not a winery is interested in having guest accommodations, they might want to talk to their planner and determine if they can be approved using a home occupation permit. Home occupations are permitted in most zones, but in EFU, they have a few additional parameters. For instance, the activity associated with the home occupation must take place indoors. It may not interfere with the other uses permitted in the zone and may employ no more than five people full or part time. That's a ton of information to digest and you absolutely do not need to study these pages and statute, but you do need to know a few things. First, appreciate that no two farms are truly alike. So although you may have a friend or a neighbor who's hosting agritourism events on their property, don't assume that you can do the exact same thing without talking to your planner first. Finicky little details like flood zones, scenic overlays, can make a really big difference in what you may offer to visitors. As much as new business ideas are truly exciting and we just wanna get busy with them, it's advisable that you slow down, 
and proceed with patience and caution. As you're starting to form formulate your business ideas, call your county planner and discuss your ideas. They truly are eager to help you succeed. They also have to make sure that while they're helping you grow your business, they're not negatively impacting your neighbors or traffic flow or the other components of your community. Together, you can surely find a way to bring your business to life. When you call your planner or go for a visit, you'll wanna make sure you're going to visit the right person. In some places, there are both city and county planners, so I recommend calling with your address or tax lot number to determine who you need to speak with first. We've got a link to county planners a little later in this presentation, and that's a terrific starting point. When you call them, you wanna make sure you do have your property address or tax lot number in hand, and if you're working on numerous properties that you've purchased at different times, it's important to have all of the addresses. When you call your planner, think of yourself as a detective. You want to find all the details that will solve the case. Share with the planner what you hope to do. And if your idea is brand new and doesn't fit neatly into a zone or permit, ask for guidance and suggestions. Maybe you can tweak your business plan a little bit, or maybe there's a permit available that isn't one we've discussed here today, but is a better fit for your property and your business idea. Discuss your long and short term goals as well. As I mentioned earlier, your planner really wants to see you live on your farm and thrive on your land for a long time. So they will do their very best to grow with you. And if it weren't for creative planners, we would have never had Senate Bill 960. Okay, we're done with the biggest section and the most complicated. Everything from this point should be easy breezy. Building codes believe it or not, are considered easy in this, in this uh, arena that we're working in. Building codes and building permits are really important to consider if you're renovating an old structure for a new use. Even something as simple as turning your kid's old room into a guest suite for folks that aren't family members might require that you have additional permits for things like fire and life safety devices. And if you're building something like a farm stand or other structure that will be open to the public, you'll need to comply with lots of standards, including accessibility. Sanitation is also a very important issue. Septic systems require inspection and approval. I highly recommend that when you're talking to your planner, you get the name of the building code person that you'll want to be working with if your plans include adding new structures or making, making changes to your current ones. Growing and selling food also comes with its own set of regulations, and you've probably encountered most of these already. But if you're expanding what you're offering or you're providing a value-added product, you'll want to spend some time taking a look at the regulations that apply to your specific business. Not complying with these regulations can lead you to time-consuming and costly problems down the road. So once again, it's best to investigate the permits you need before you grow your business. Remember, you don't want to make the same mistakes I did and get that nasty letter in the mail. The Oregon Department of Agriculture is responsible for regulating the processing and production of foods such as meats, eggs, shellfish, and dairy. So you'll need to make sure you're meeting their requirements and obtaining the appropriate permits. However, when you move into selling the items that you're growing and producing, you also may need to work with your county health inspector who has jurisdiction over things like restaurants and food service. Federal food safety regu regulations can come into play as well. Many of these programs are designed to prevent foodborne illnesses related to fresh products. Should an illness be traced back to your facility, you could lose your license altogether. So it's really important that you know what standards and procedures you need to implement. The links here are a terrific place to start. And just like planners, the staff at health departments is happy to talk to you and explain just what you need to do in order to operate your business legally. Don't hesitate to contact them for assistance as you're building your business plan. Even if you're just having a one-time special event, you'll need to talk to your health department if it involves food service. A farm dinner will require a temporary restaurant permit. And if your staff is selling food at a harvest festival, then they'll need food handlers permits as well. And just like land use, there may be variations of the permits needed from one county to the next. So it's always best to call your health department first. 
If you're thinking about adding a mobile food cart to your operation, you'll also want to have a lengthy conversation with your building code folks and the health department. There's a useful guide that Multnomah County produced, and although it is specific to Multnomah County, it's a great place to start to get an overview of all of the elements involved with building a food cart. In summary, you need to remember just a few things. One is that your county planner is truly your friend. If you haven't met them, find their contact information by following the link here, and be sure to give them a call. A phone conversation or an in-person meeting is a great way to understand all of the options available to you on your property and to learn how you can grow your business. Contact them first so that you can be flexible in your planning. And don't hesitate to contact colleagues and ask for guidance. If you know somebody that's operating a business that's like what you want to do, pick up the phone, give them a call, ask them for guidance, ask them what obstacles they encountered, and ask them how they tackled them. And last but not least, don't forget to take advantage of all of the available resources, such as the Travel Oregon Agritourism Handbook. The Oregon State University Small Farms Program has lots of information about food safety and processing. And Farmstay USA has a terrific guide on how to start a farmstay. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope that you've found some worthwhile information in here and that you take some time to go back and visit these links and build your new agritourism business.